Hey guys, my name is Gavin, I'm an English teacher here at the Dublin Academy um, and welcome along to Whiteboard Wednesday. So basically what I wanted to do is take a little bit of time just to talk to you about one of my favourite topics and one topic that we love teaching here at the Academy which is poetry, uh, everybody's favourite topic, but um, maybe not. But basically, so what I wanted to do today is I wanted to start off with a little bit of unseen poetry and then again later on we'll, we'll have a little look at, at studying poetry. But don't knock off straight away yet because everybody's straight away kind of thinking, oh, well, unseen poetry is quite easy. You know, just read the poem, answer questions, it'll be simple, it's the last thing that I'll do. Yes, definitely, it should be the last thing you do, but again, what we want to do is we want to really cement that 5%. We want to make sure that we're getting as many of those 20 marks as possible. And also what I would say is everything that I'm about to talk to you about in terms of our pattern, imagery, sensuousness and suggestiveness is all totally applicable for our study of poetry too. You cannot do well at studying poetry unless you know this information. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by just talking about a little bit about our time and our marking scheme. So I've already mentioned there we're dealing with 5%. 5% guys might not seem like a lot of, to a lot of uh, percentage, but again, we're still talking about the difference between grade points. We're talking about our H1 and our H2. You know, if we're not really cementing and, and producing really good unseen poetry, we're gonna suffer, okay? So basically what we have is we have 22 minutes to attack this part of the question. Do it last. I have it here, guys. This is the last thing that you should do. Again, the amount of times, you know, correcting papers, if you sit down and you see individuals have tried to start with the unseen poetry and think, you know what, I'll just get it done. I'll get it out of the way and they've just waited and waited and they've tried to dissect and decipher and it just hasn't gone for them. Guys, please look at this last, all right? That's the thing that you should be focusing on last, okay? It's 22 minutes, it's a guts of two A4 pages is what you wanna be writing. And effectively what I wanna tell you guys today is, is that it's very, very kind of predictable. A lot of the questions, a lot of the style of questions are very, very similar. Again, remember, examiners want you to do well in this section. They actually want you to show off in this section. They're not trying to trip you up, despite what people think, okay? But in terms of our predictability, in terms of the questions that come up the entire time, we know the breakdown at this stage. In terms of question one, there's both an A and B question. And typically, we get a nice, simple question in there. Do you like this poem and why do you like this poem? Or you get a question on imagery and things like that. Nice, easy, rudimental questions. What I'm gonna tell you guys to do is I'm gonna focus on, tell you guys to focus on the question two question, all right? It's 20 marks, it's one question, and typically, guys, what we tend to look at here is a style question, okay? So this is typically a style-based question. Once you have a real good grasp of aesthetic language, what you do, all you need to do is you, need, you don't even need to understand the poem that you're looking at. You just need to look at the poem and kind of take one or two bits of information and then amalgamate that within your answer, all right? So that's what I'd argue. You guys, have a look. If you don't believe me, have a look at the past paper questions. Look for that question too, and identify how many times they ask you about style, how many times they ask you about the poet's use of language. Anytime you see those words, language, style, you know what, we're on to a winner, all right? So those are the predictability in terms of the questions. They're the questions that we expect to come up, okay? So that's our little breakdown in terms of unseen poetry and how to go about it. Now, What's much, much more important, and as I said at the start of this little video, is that it's very, very important that we understand pattern, imagery, sensuousness, and suggestiveness. Now, the reason being is, I haven't taken these words just from the thesaurus. The reason why I'm talking about these four words is because they're down in the department marking scheme. They ask us, as examiners, have candidates identified the pattern nature of language? Have they identified you know, the, the interesting imagery? Have they grasped sensuousness? Have they understood how sensuous the poem is and then their ability to talk about the suggestive qualities of the poem, okay? So it's there, it's in the department marking scheme. What we do is we take that vocab and then we regurgitate and we give it back to them, okay? Makes an examiner's life very, very easy. They see a word that literally corresponds to their marking scheme, they just have to give you a big old tick, all right? So that's very, very important that we focus on this little uh, um, acronym, this, these four words, okay? So let me talk to you about it very, very quickly in terms of why and how we use pattern imagery, sensuousness, and suggestiveness. We use this information to dissect the poem that we have in front of us. Now, we can, we can take our unseen poem, that's what we're talking about, and you can consider all of this information for that poem, but also while you're sitting there and you're watching this video, also kind of think about your study poetry. Also kind of think of Paul Durkin for an example. And you think, how am I going to use this information to dissect sport? Or how am I going to use this information to dissect the difficulty that is marriage, all right? We need this information. And you need to talk about this new information. And you need to talk about it, you know, a lot within your exams in order to get marks, okay? So effectively, pattern. What is pattern? We look at the pattern of our poems and our po of our poetry. And pattern is broken down into three areas. Form and content, repetition, repetition, little poetry joke, 
and then sounds, okay? So form and content is something that 99% of the student populace don't talk about for whatever reason. So if you end up in that 1%, can you imagine, examiner, it's something different, it's something unique, and you start talking about you know, the interesting you know, form and content, whether it's conventional, unconventional, whether it's a uniform home or a non-uniform. All this guy's gone through in terms of, we go through all of this in the weekly grind, so if there's a lot of terminology, a lot of vocab coming up that you don't understand, that's where we go through it, all right? So again, that's the 1% of our student populace, that's what we talk about. In terms of repetition here, Repetition, great word. We look for the pattern nature in terms of repetition. We can't have poetry without repetition. That's absolutely fine. But again, a lot of people will be able to, you know, any kind of very kind of like middle of the road student can identify, you know, when a word is repeated, when a line is repeated. The high, but the, like the excellent students, what you guys can mention is you can mention specific terminology though for repetition. Words like anaphora, words like lineation, words like refrain. That's so much better than just saying, you know, I like the repetition within this poem. Now you have the ability to say, you know, the poet uses lineation here because they really like this line or they're trying to emphasize something, okay? Our sound technique, guys, I wouldn't kind of insult your intelligence by, you know, mentioning alliteration and assonance. These are things that, were, that we learned in kind of senior infants. But what we do is we push on here, and what we mention is, again, this vocab that's gonna separate us from the herd. We mention terms like, obviously, onomatopoeia, obviously a good one to, to spell as well. But we mention terms like euphony and cacophony, and we identify them in a poem versus, you know, again, here's alliteration. Very, very easy to identify. We kind of branch out, we try and branch out, we try and use a little bit of different, exciting vocab, helps our, helps our grade massively, okay? So that's our pattern nature. We then move on to kind of imagery. And, and imagery, again, poetry, what is poetry without imagery, okay? So there's a huge amount that you guys already know about imagery, but there's potentially some other things here that you might find new and kind of useful today, okay? Comparisons are our metaphors, our similes, our personification, our anthropomorphism, that might be a new one if you're unfamiliar with that. Again, that, that's kind of the standard, that's the caliber of the terminology that we're talking about here. Lit abs, again, I know it sounds like a six minute workout video, but again, lit abs is the definition of poetry. When poets take something literal, something concrete like a, a, a pen or a marker or a table or a mountain, and they use it to describe something abstract, something metaphorical. All right, once you get a good grasp of that, that's huge, guys, for your unseen poetry. All right, a lot of our unseen poems will have this lit abs, the literal to the abstract concept. Again, something we go through in a huge amount of detail within the grinds. Vocab choice, personal favorite of mine. And if you consider that you know, a really decent student will be able to take one line from a poem, we'll talk about you know, the metaphor, we'll talk about the impact that it had on you. The excellent students, what you guys will be able to do is you'll be able to take one word. If you take Child by Sylvia Plath, you know, for example, you know, not this troublous ringing of hands, this dark ceiling without a star. Why is the word ceiling so important within that poem? And then your ability to write half an A4 page, you know, a paragraph on the significance of the word ceiling, again, immediately elevates your paper into the stratosphere, into a different, it's different gravy altogether, okay? So vocab choice, again, is when poets use one word that has a huge amount of emphasis, huge amount of meaning, okay? Like what is poetry, as I said, without imagery? That's a huge, a very, very important section that you guys need to grasp. Okay, guys, so then moving on from imagery again, we have a, like almost a little mathematical equation there. It's like pattern plus imagery plus what's called sensuousness. Nice little poll quiz question there, how many S's in sensuousness? But effectively, this is, again, very similar to imagery in the sense that this is the essence of poetry, why we're not reading a work of narrative, why we're reading aesthetic language. It's because poetry is designed to make us feel. And again, you know, we talk about our senses, you can see it here, it tastes, it touch it and smell it, fine. And again, that's our middle of the road students. Those of us looking to excel, what we talk about is, you know, we talk about the visual qualities, the visual qualities of the imagery. You know, how aural the euphony and cacophony was, you know, the aural there, people were already going into a cold sweat, you know, thinking about Seamus from Donegal and their Irish aural. Tactile. And, and again, how, like, you know, if you read anything like a jolt or if, there's, if it's cold outside or it's hot, if you can actually feel it, you know, the cool breeze, we describe that as tactile. And the reason why I guys have a line here underneath those three is because you should have them no matter what. In fifth year, you should have them ingrained in the brain, all right, let alone sixth year. The reason why I have a line here is because, again, this is, we're talking about our excellent students now, those of us willing to push on. 
Now we're talking about things like olfactory and things, uh, and things like gustatory. Olfactory is when you can smell the information, all right? And gustatory is when you can taste it. Now it's very rare that you get a poem that is quite a tasty poem that you can taste what's going on. But olfactory, any times you get anything like cut grass, for example, anything to do with flowers, and rather than saying, you know, I really like that metaphor, I really like that simile, fine, middle of the road. Now, on the other hand, what we're saying is, you know, the poet's use of olfactory qualities within this poem, blah, 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 all right? So again, that's, that's our upper echelons there. Again, these are the three that we absolutely should know, okay? So guys, going back to our little mathematical equation, pattern, which we've discussed, plus imagery, plus sensuousness, equals what's called suggestiveness. And this is our ability to talk about the poem. And again, considering the fact that we have about an A4 page and a half to two A4 pages for our unseen poetry, I know maybe at this stage it seems like a lot, but it really isn't that much you know, in order to express yourself. What examiners are looking for is your ability to talk about how, how it made you feel, okay? Uh, and again, whether it made you feel anything or whether you know that you're an absolute stone wall or whether you absolutely hated the poem, lie, fake it, all right? We need to see, you know, how struck by you know the image you are, how much you were moved by how you know aural the qualities were within it. That's what we're looking for here. It's these lines here that separate our H1, H2 from everyone else. Okay, your ability to engage with the poem. There's two words that I talk about in the weekly grinds here the entire time, which is impact and engagement. Okay, it's all about impact. What impact did this question A section have on you? What impact did this poem have on you? If it hasn't had one again, as I said, lie, fake it, give the examiners what they want, give us that sensuousness, give us your opinion, okay? So again, it's your ability also to engage with the material, and again, that's kind of sentences like, I was struck by how musical this poem was, or it moves me, it moved me how visual this metaphor or simile was, etc., etc., okay? So guys, we have a nice little mathematical equation here, again, it's one thing that not a lot of English teachers would like to admit, but English is very, very close to maths, or certainly a lot closer than, than people will think. It's incredibly formulaic. Pattern plus imagery plus sensuousness equals suggestiveness. We dissect our poem with our PIS, and that gives us the suggestiveness. Okay, so guys, what we've done is, I know again, I started off talking about the fact that this is an unseen poem and it's an unseen poetry breakdown, and it 100% is. Everything we've just spoken about there here is going to give you the ability to, you know, look at a poem, a poem you've never ever seen before, and dissect that information really quickly too. However, everything we've just gone through, this little acronym here as well, is totally applicable for your studied poetry, okay? Every single poem that you look at now, whether it's by Bishop, whether it's by Durkin, whoever, that you take this information and you think, right, what elements of pattern can I find with this? Imagery, sensuousness, etc. So, okay, guys, um, I hope you found that helpful. Again, we're gonna do a hell of a lot more Whiteboard Wednesdays going through a number of different topics, both paper one and paper two. My name's Gavin, thanks a lot.